Welcome back to Reproductive Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue our study of the female reproductive anatomy, and this time we're going to be looking at a posterior view of the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. Okay. So if we take a look at this image down here of the woman, we're clearly looking at her backside, so this is going to be the posterior aspect of the uterus. And in this video, we're going to be looking at three major things. Uh, one, we're going to be looking at the various regions of the uterus and the fallopian tube. It turns out that different regions of the uterus and the fallopian tubes are named differently. They're regional. Sort of like when we looked at the stomach anatomy in the digestive system, we saw that there were different parts of the stomach, like the fundus, the cardiac region, the body, the pylorus, and, and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing. The second thing we're going to be looking at is the layers of the wall of the uterus. And it turns out there are three layers of this wall. And we've seen things similar to this all over anatomy and physiology, so this really won't be anything new. Hopefully this will be pretty simple. And then the third thing we're going to be looking at are the ligaments that are all over the reproductive anatomy of the female. And these ligaments collectively are really designed just to anchor the uterus and the fallopian tubes in place. And it's especially important for the fallopian tubes because if you look at these tubes, they're really just thin hose-like structures. So they could, if there were no ligaments, you could imagine them flopping all over the place. Like if you had a hose that was that was chaotically spraying water, be flying all over the place. You've seen those videos. So we need these ligaments to anchor those structures in place. All right, let's begin by taking a look at some of these anatomical structures. At the bottom here, we of course have the vagina. I don't think we need to linger there too much. We, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we covered that in more detail in the previous video. However, what is important for these purposes right here is the uterus and also the interface between the vagina and the uterus. So we're actually going to take a zoomed in look at this. If we look first at the interface between the vagina and the uterus, we see these regions right here that kind of protrude into the vagina, these are the cervixes. Okay, so this is actually the left cervix over here. This over here would be the right cervix. And again, not to get too much into the physiology because we'll be covering this later, but the cervix is very important for childbirth. So the developing fetus, and ultimately the infant upon birth, is going to be developing inside the uterus. And so obviously during birth, labor, the infant's going to have to move head first down through this opening right here, which is actually called the cervical canal, and then ultimately into the vagina and out. But as the baby is moving, it's going head first, and it's going to be pushing on the walls of the cervix right here. And actually, the more the baby pushes on that cervix, the more oxytocin that's going to be released, and it occurs in a positive feedback cycle. And it turns out that that oxytocin is going to stimulate smooth muscle that we're going to see in a few minutes in the wall of the uterus that's going to help force the baby out, sort of like squeezing toothpaste out of the bottle, right? Also in this region, flanking each of the cervixes, we have the fornix on either side. So this little space right here that kind of looks like a horn going up, this space is going to be the fornix. So this would be the left lateral fornix, this would be the right lateral fornix. Okay? So now let's go and take a look at some of the pieces of the uterus. Now obviously the inside of it is going to be a space. Okay, that's where the baby is eventually going to be developing. The space is called the lumen of the uterus, or just the lumen. This top part of the uterus, the most superior aspect, is going to be the fundus region. And then pretty much all of this large area in the center of it is going to be the body of the uterus. Okay? Uh, and of course, down here, we already mentioned this is the cervix down here. All right. Now, let's actually go and take a look at these fallopian tubes now. Now again, the fallopian tubes is one name. Um, some sources will actually call them uterine tubes. I think on the previous video, yeah, it actually called it, where is it, the uterine tube. But that term is synonymous with fallopian tube. Now, if we take a look at this one over here on the patient's right, we're going to follow the fallopian tube around here, just like a hose, and then it's going to loop back around, and it's going to indirectly make contact with this structure right here, which is an ovary. Now, this is a cross-section of an ovary. We're not going to talk about the pieces inside of it yet, but this is your ovary, the right ovary. And, of course, we have a left and right of each of these. So here would be the left fallopian tube, 
we can follow this around and it's going to have these finger-like projections at the end that indirectly make contact with the left ovary. Okay? Now, the fallopian tube is itself divided into several regions. Okay? The first one, which is not labeled here, is not really a region so much as it is a part of it, but notice that the inside of this is just a space. It's hollow. It's like the inside of a hose. So that would be the lumen of the fallopian tube, and that makes sense that it is hollow because it's a tube. Right? And actually, as the secondary oocyte is ovulated, that's the egg, when it's ovulated from the ovary into this fallopian tube, it's going to have to be fertilized actually in this region right here, and then it's going to eventually develop and move through this fallopian tube into the uterus. Okay? So this part of the fallopian tube that's closest to the uterus, in fact it pretty much just comes off of it, is the region known as the isthmus. Okay? If we then follow the fallopian tube around here, we're going to see this region right here. It kind of bulges a little bit. This part is called the ampulla. Okay? We can actually see it a little bit better over here. This region right here is the ampulla. Just flanking the ampulla, we have this region that's going to project into finger-like projections. So this region right here at the base of these fingers is called the infundibulum. You can't see the fingers too much in this picture right here, but the fingers come right off of the infundibulum. Okay. So in this side over here, this would be our infundibulum, and then these finger-like projections coming off of the infundibulum are referred to as fimbriae. And it would appear that the fimbriae sort of hold this ovary in place. That is actually not the case. The fimbriae do not hold the ovary in place. Actually, all these ligaments that are around here, including the broad ligament and the ovarian ligament, are actually what hold the ovaries in place. The fimbriae actually do not make direct contact with the ovary. They're close to it, but they normally don't make contact. There is one moment, though, in the menstrual cycle when the fimbriae do make contact, and that is during ovulation when the egg, which turns out to be a secondary oocyte, is transferred from the ovary into the fallopian tube, and that's when the fimbriae actually make contact. But it's actually the ligaments there that hold the ovaries in place. So that's the first thing we covered. Hopefully that makes sense. You understand the pieces there. Now let's go to the second thing we were going to talk about, and those are the layers of the wall of the uterus. I'm actually going to zoom in here a little bit more. So we have three layers. We have the endometrium, myometrium, and the parametrium. Now obviously the outer layer here, the most superficial one, is going to be the parametrium. The innermost layer is going to be the endometrium. Now the endometrium and the myometrium are the two layers where most of the interesting things actually happen. Now I'll talk about this more whenever I do the developmental biology playlist. I have not actually done that yet. It will be up soon, hopefully. But I've got this ovary right here. And the ovary is responsible for two major things. Um, I talked about this in the previous video. One, it's responsible for hormone synthesis, mainly estradiol and progesterone. But the second thing that it does, different cells, that is, they perform folliculogenesis and oogenesis. So those processes collectively manufacture the egg that is eventually or could potentially be fertilized by a sperm cell. And that egg, which is in the form of a secondary oocyte, is ovulated into the fallopian tubes. And it turns out that approximately in the ampulla region of this fallopian tube, that's where fertilization occurs, if it occurs at all. So the sperm cell, of course, would have to travel up through the vagina, up through the cervical canal, up through the uterus, and then it would have to go up the fallopian tube all the way around here and make contact with the secondary oocyte in the ampulla. But in any case, my whole point was, once fertilization occurs and you get the zygote, you're going to get development of that cell and multiple cell divisions, and eventually you're going to get a structure called a blastocyst. And that blastocyst is going to come through the fallopian tube, through the uh, isthmus, and into the uterus, and it's going to implant in the uterine wall. Sort of like if you bury an onion in the ground in hopes to grow more onions, right? That's a terrible example, but you have to bury that onion in the soil. That's sort of what the blastocyst is doing. It's going to bury itself in the uterine wall. And considering the innermost layer is the endometrium, that's the layer where the blastocyst is going to implant. So that actually has some neat physiology right there as well. Now the middle layer of the wall of the uterus is the myometrium. You can clearly see the myometrium is the thickest layer. Uh, that's pretty typical because the myometrium, as indicated by the prefix myo, is loaded with smooth muscle. 
Now, this smooth muscle is especially sensitive to oxytocin. Okay? Now, remember what I said, uh, that, of course, the implantation of the blastocyst occurs in the uterine wall in the endometrium, but eventually you're going to have something that resembles a baby. And let's suppose it's right before childbirth. So hasn't been initiated yet, but we've basically got a fully formed baby here in the lumen of the uterus. And so when childbirth is initiated, the baby's head is going to be pushed through this canal right here. This is the cervical canal, but in doing so, it's going to put pressure or stress on the walls of the cervix. And there are receptors in there, and when they are stretched, they stimulate the release of oxytocin from the hypothalamus, really the posterior pituitary. And the harder the infant pushes on the walls of the cervix, the more oxytocin is released. It's a positive feedback cycle. Now the nice thing about that oxytocin is it'll come back from the posterior pituitary and bind to receptors on the smooth muscle cells of the myometrium, and it stimulates them to contract. And so it'll force the baby even further through. Like I mentioned before, it's kind of like if you got a tube of toothpaste and you got a little bit left, maybe only about 5-10% of the toothpaste, you have to kind of squeeze it out, right? That's sort of what the uterus is going to do ultimately to the baby as it forces it through the cervical canal. Okay, And you can imagine the size of the baby relative to the cervical canal, so you can imagine that cervical canal is going to be not only have to stretch, but it's going to be capable of a significant amount of stretch in order to fit the baby through this canal. Okay, So there's our second thing, cover the walls of the uterus. Now the last thing we're going to cover in this video, the third thing, are the ligaments. We're only going to be able to see a, f a few in this slide, so we'll have to go back to one of the previous slides to actually see all of them, but there's some here that we couldn't see before. Okay? The first one I'm going to start with is what's called the broad ligament. Now, the broad ligament is this really big sheet that you see uh, between the uh, tubing of the fallopian tube. It goes all the way down here. Uh, the way I think of the broad ligament is it sort of looks like uh, the webbing between duck toes. I'm not an ornithologist, I don't know if ducks actually have what you call toes, but I think you get my point. It's like the webbing, okay? And you see that it lies between the fallopian tube and the ovary, it lies inferior to the ovary, connects it to the lateral side of the uterus, and so on and so forth. It's a broad sheet, okay? And this broad ligament is going to play a role in anchoring these fallopian tubes in place, because as I mentioned before, we don't want them swinging around like a hose that's chaotically spurting water. Right? We want to hold those fallopian tubes in place and also fix them uh, um, in place relative to the sides of the uterus. So the other thing that the broad ligament is going to do is it's going to have its fibers run inferiorly and it's going to anchor all these structures ultimately to the floor of the pelvic bone. Okay, So that's the broad ligament and it also is divided into three separate regions. The first part is what's called the mesosalpinx, and this is the region uh, near the fallopian tubes. If you've ever taken a medical terminology course, what you know is that salpinx is actually the term that we use for uterine or fallopian tubes. So mesosalpinx is just the part of the broad ligament in that region. The mesovarium is going to be the part of this that actually surrounds the ovary. So it's mes ovarium because it's surrounding the ovary. And then this part down here, the mesometrium, is going to be the part that kind of goes and anchors to the uterus. Okay? Notice that the walls of the uterus, these layers, are actually having the suffix metrium. So metrium is actually referring to the uterus. So the mesometrium is going to anchor this to the uterus. Okay? So those are your three regions of the broad ligament. The rest of these are a lot more straightforward. For example, I think this is the easiest one, the ovarian ligament. This is the ligament that holds the ovary in place. Remember, these fimbriae of the fallopian tube do not actually make direct contact with the ovary. They don't hold the ovary in place like a hand. Actually, the ovary is held in place through two of these ligaments. One is the one I just mentioned, the broad ligament, but the other one, which anchors the ovary directly to the uterus, is called the ovarian ligament. And this one actually resembles a true ligament that you might find in the knee joint or something like that. So it's just kind of a rope-like structure. Okay. And then, of course, we have an ovarian ligament here on this side, anchoring this right ovary to the right side of the uterus. Okay. Now this one that's kind of originating on the same point but working its way downward, this one is called the round ligament of the uterus. And to really see this, we're going to go back to 
one of the previous slides. So here's actually our round ligament right here. Now there is a left and a right of these, even though it appears like there's one. So this one would actually be, it looks like the left round ligament because uh, we actually cut the body in half through a mid-sagittal plane. So this over here is the left fallopian tube. So this is the left round ligament. And what the round ligaments do is they anchor the front part of the uterus ultimately to uh, the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, so there's two of these. Then we've got over here what's called the uterosacral ligament. The uterosacral ligament is the ligament that actually anchors the posterior side of the uterus, uh, ultimately to the sacrum. Recall that the sacrum is just the one of the lower parts of the vertebrae, just above the coccyx. So the uterosacral ligament is going to anchor the uterus to the sacrum. You can't see most of that ligament here because it's running ultimately uh, through the peritoneal wall right here, and then it will make contact with the sacrum. Okay. And the final ligament here is the suspensory ligament. Um, it says here part of the broad ligament, but technically the suspensory ligament is considered its own ligament. Um, you notice here that it's actually attaching to the fallopian tube, so this would be the left suspensory ligament. And what it does is it projects upward, but also is going to anchor the fallopian tube to the lateral side of the abdominal wall. Okay, So there are five ligaments that we need to know. The suspensory ligaments, round ligaments, the uterosacral ligament, and then on this slide we saw two more, the ovarian ligaments and the broad ligaments. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the remainder of the female reproductive anatomy. Um, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get an introduction to uh, fertilization and development and all that stuff. And we're going to track the movement of the secondary oocyte and the resulting structures post-fertilization from the ovary ultimately into the uterus. We're just going to track the movements, the flow. What structures does it go through? And then we're also going to track the movement of a sperm cell. So suppose we have fertilization, uh, there was sexual intercourse. What pathway does the sperm cell have to take in order to get to that secondary oocyte and cause fertilization? All right. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.